Hello, grade fours. And this is chapter 11, where we will be continuing to learn about geometry. Yes, guys, there's more geometry. It only gets harder. Anyhow, the first concept we're going to teach you is congruency. So there's similar figures, congruent figures, and the figures that just aren't either of them. So similar figures have the same sh shape as in ratios. Say we have, uh, well, a rectangle, and then another rectangle. It's just that the sides, the ratios of the sides, are the same. And if you don't know about ratios yet, ratios yet well, think fractions. Anyhow, basically it's the same shape, different sizes, of course. Unless it's something like this. Because they have to be the same shape, they can't be one circle and one oval. Congruent figures are just the same. So similar, similar figures are a little bit more complicated. So for the most part, we're going to be focusing on congruent figures, which are basically just copy-paste. That's the general gist of congruent figures. They're exactly the same. Now for some practice problems, tell whether the figures are congruent. Write yes or no. Now are these two shapes the same? I mean, just look at them. One's shaped completely different from the other. So, no. Congruency means that they are the same in size and shape. Now these two, they're both triangles, but one's turned that way and the other one's turned, well, that way. But, are they the same shape that are the same size? If you cut one of them out and then try to overlap it on top of the other one, will it be the same? Yes, guys, it is. If you really want to think about it this way, congruency is also when you cut a figure out and then put it on top of the other one and if it's the exact same. It's just exact sameness. Now here, they're the same shape, but they're not the same size. This is more of a similar figures example. But similar figures aren't congruent. So no, they are not congruent. We're looking for congruency here, remember? Now these two, they're both pentagons and they're the same size. And it looks as if if you just plop one off the sheet or screen or whatever you're doing your homework on, and then plop it on top of the other one, they would be, well, perfectly overlapping. Which means that, yes, they are congruent. This one here, they're both 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7 sides. Remember from the previous chapter what I told you 7-sided shapes were called? Septagons. They're both septagons, but one's obviously not the same size as the other. So no, they are not congruent. It's more of a similar shape thing. These two parallelograms, actually, no, they're not rhombuses. These two parallelograms, are they the same? If you cut one out and then plop it onto the other one, does it look like they will overlap? Or if you measure all the sides, Will it be the same measurements? I mean, it looks as if it is going to be. So, yes. These shapes are congruent. So that's about it for congruency. What you really need to take from this chapter is congruency means same shape, same size. Similarity, it's a little bit more complicated. They're the same shape, except the size kind of changes, of course. 
By same shape, I don't mean isosceles triangle and scalene triangle. They're both triangles, but they're not similar. They're not the same shape. Mm, if you want to think about it, think of similarity as you enlarge a picture. Like, say you have a tiny photo. You know those school photos that they like sell you on those magnets but they could also sell them in those really big sheets but you still look the same it's basically that that's similarity congruency is just two magnets they're the same and uh, neither is just they're completely different <laughs> Now, if you want to take a break at any time during the video, feel free to do so. But if you don't want to take a break, hello! And if you just came back, well, welcome back. Anyhow, we move on to symmetry. So the line of symmetry is an imaginary line drawn somewhere on a shape, picture, object, drawing, whatever. Usually it's on a 2D drawing though, but basically the line of symmetry divides something in a way that if you fold it over, say it's a picture, if you fold it over then the two halves would look basically the same. Now here are some examples. Say a square, actually no that's more of a rectangle, a line of symmetry could be down the middle. If you fold it on the line of symmetry then, well, the two halves would look the same. It would just look like this. At least if you fold it this way. If you fold it the other way, then it would look, well, just flipped. Bilateral symmetry, and there's also rotational symmetry. Of course, if any of you studies biology, you'll end up learning about radial symmetry. There's differences between all of them. The biggest difference is bilateral symmetry. So bilateral symmetry is usually you draw a line down the middle of something and wow, there's a line of symmetry. And if you spin it around, if you spin the shape around, the shape might not have well, you can't just draw lines of symmetry everywhere. Thing is, the definition of bilateral symmetry changes a lot once you get into higher grades. For now, bilateral symmetry is just, say, something like a square. You could... Uh, there's four lines of symmetry, and if you fold it, then it looks the same. But in higher grades, bilateral symmetry usually refers to, well, a certain line in most animals. In fact, there's also a lot of different biological classifications on that, but you guys are in grade 4 and you don't need to worry about that yet. For all I know, some people, uh, well, well, some of you guys aren't even planning to go into biology or chemistry. Maybe you guys want to go into physics. You guys are probably also going to learn this in physics. Anyhow, rotational symmetry is you get something, you turn it around, you rotate it, and the thing still looks the same. Say you have a four-leafed clover. This is one of the most terrible four-leaf clovers I've drawn. Yeah, that, this, is, this actually does not look that good. Anyhow, if you turn a four-leaf clover around, say 90 degrees, it will look the same. If you turn it around 180 degrees, it will still look the same. If you turn it around 270 degrees, it will still look the same. If you turn it around 360 degrees, then you're just in the original position, so I don't know why you would do that. Now, of course, nature doesn't provide, or at least usually doesn't provide, perfectly symmetrical things. There's always, well, usually these perfectly symmetrical examples, well, they're more mathematical shapes. 
However, you can say that this daisy has rotational symmetry because if you spin it around, then it will look practically the same. It will overlap in practically the same ways. But there's also radial symmetry, which is basically you could draw a line of symmetry anywhere and it will basically form an actual line of symmetry. You could draw a line as long as it touches the center anywhere and it will become a line of symmetry. But yeah, essentially bilateral symmetry is you draw a line in specific places and you will find that if you fold it, well, the two parts will overlap perfectly. But if it's rotational symmetry, it's you spin it around a certain number of degrees and if uh, the figure that you got spinning around overlaps the original figure perfectly, then it has rotational symmetry. Hmm. Which is strange. Because sometimes you use bilateral symmetry a lot as you get older, but you use rotational symmetry less. Then again, that depends on which profession you go into. Tell whether each figure has line symmetry, right? Yes or no. Basically, does it have a line of symmetry? Now, an octagon over here, we could divide it down the middle, and then we could fold it, and we realize that Yes, it does have bi bilateral symmetry, at least. It's not so much rotational, unless you decide to rotate it 180 degrees. But hey, huh, we can't have everything. Anyhow, we could also use this axis as a line of symmetry. So yeah, it does have line symmetry. It does have many lines of symmetry. And question number two is, OK, that's just a weird shape. That's a really weird shape. If you try to draw a line of symmetry anywhere over there, you're not going to get, well, anything. You're not going to get bilateral symmetry in any way. And if you try to rotate the figure, they're not going to overlap, unless you rotate it completely in a full circle, which in that case, everything overlaps perfectly if you just rotate it completely in a full circle, because that's its original position. So, no, you can't draw any lines of symmetry, and it doesn't ask for rotational symmetry either, so no. This triangle over here, it seems to be isosceles. Now, isosceles triangles always will have at least one line of symmetry. Why at least one? Because technically, equilateral triangles are isosceles. There, there's a line of symmetry. Therefore, it has line symmetry. Okay, now, tell whether the dashed line is a line of symmetry. Then tell whether the figure has rotational symmetry. Write yes or no. Okay. So, for the most part, the line of symmetry will pass through the center or middle of, well, the figure. And for question number four, that is certainly not the case. And if you want to see if it's a line of symmetry, you could just do the folding test or the mental folding test, and it's pretty obvious that these two pieces are not the same. So no for the first one. It's not a line of symmetry, but does the circle have rotational symmetry? I mean, if you put a pen in the center of a circle and then spin the circle around, it's always going to look the same. So technically, it does have rotational symmetry, although this would be more of a radial symmetry thing. Rotational symmetry and radial symmetry, they kind of overlap a little bit. They're like this really weirdly constructed Venn diagram, which just, it's convoluted and complicated and, oh dear. Yeah. Anyhow, question number five. 
Is it a line of symmetry? Well, if you fold it, it's going to end up looking like this. And that does not perfectly overlap. So, no to the first one. And does this figure have rotational symmetry? Well, it's a parallelogram. If you put a pen in the middle of a parallelogram, say you cut out a parallelogram, don't actually do that, just think about it in your head, and then you spin it around. Or you could draw it out, but it's not going to look the same unless you turn it 300 and 60 degrees, in which case everything looks the same if you turn it 360 degrees. Rotate it 360 degrees at one certain point. Everything's going to look the same, so now for the second one. Question number six. Well, the dashed line, if you fold along the dashed line, you will find that it overlaps perfectly. I know that I'm not drawing it perfectly, but tell me guys, how, how many of you can draw a perfectly straight line without a ruler? 100% of the time. It's actually really hard. Perfectly straight, guys. Anyhow, so yes to the first one. Because it is a line of symmetry. If you fold it, then the two parts are, they overlap completely and perfectly. Then tell whether the figure has rotational symmetry. Okay. Rotational symmetry. You put a pen here, you spin it around, and it's not going to be, it's not. It doesn't. The standard for rotational symmetry is usually... The standard way to judge it is to turn it around 90 degrees by 90 degrees, and this would only work if it's turned around 180 degrees, so technically it does not have rotational symmetry. Anyhow, we are still not on to problem solving, which is amazing considering that we're going on to now, what would geometry be without perimeter? So, perimeter is fairly simple. The way to calculate perimeter is basically the same for, it's actually technically the same, for every single kind of closed figure. Perimeter is the distance around a closed figure. To find the perimeter, add the length of all the sides. If there's three sides, you add three numbers. If there's four sides, you add four numbers. If there's 18 sides, you add 18 numbers. Anyhow, the perimeter of the rectangle is, well, what are the side lengths? We have 14 inches plus 14 inches plus 3 inches plus 3 inches. And that is equal to do, 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 34 inches. All right, 34 inches. Now we're going to find the perimeter of each of these figures. We start with a triangle. A triangle has three sides. So what are these three sides? Well, there's 15 centimeters. I'll write the CM because just why not? There's 20 centimeters. And there's 25 centimeters. Add them all up and we get 60. centimeters. Don't forget the units because I've seen somebody calculate in centimeters and then accidentally forget the units only to write meters instead at the end. It was kind of sad. <laughs> they looked at their test or was it a test? I think it was either homework or test. I forgot which one. They looked at it and they're like, what did I just do? Anyhow, this is the parallelogram here. Now, parallelogram, we have 7 centimeters. 
These are quadrilaterals, so you might have noticed that there's four numbers instead of three. Eight centimeters, seven centimeters again, and eight centimeters. Now you add these up and you get 30 centimeters. Oh yes, by the way, perimeter is uh, usually mm, represented with uh, uppercase P, uppercase only, not lowercase. And if you really want to be specific, you could say P and then write in small letters triangle equals to, yeah. Now moving on, we have, uh, oh, that's, that's a rhombus. Six centimeters plus six centimeters plus six centimeters plus six centimeters. That's four six centimeters. Now what does that sound like? Multiplication. So what's four times six? 24. 24 centimeters. P rhombus. I'll just use R. Actually, no, I'll use an uppercase R. Because lowercase r is usually the letter that is used to represent radius, which you learned last section of last chapter. And diameter is lowercase d. Anyhow, 3 meters, 3 meters, 3 meters, 3 meters, 3 meters. It's a pentagon. There's five sides. All five of the sides are 3 meters. Now, what would that mean? Well, 3 times 5. Come on, guys. 15. So, P pentagon. equals to 15, and what's the unit this time? Meters, so M. Oh, there's this strange shape. There's six sides, oh, okay, six sides. Well, I guess we know what strange shape this is now. It's a hexagon. And you have to add up all the sides. So there's three meters plus four meters plus three meters, plus four meters, plus seven meters, plus eight meters, and then you add them up, and you get 29 meters. P hexagon equals to 29 meters. Oh, okay. This one has, question number six, eight sides. So you add eight numbers together. But six of these eight numbers are, well, one. So what's six times one? Six. And the other two are both threes. So three times two is six. 6 plus 6 is equal to 12. What's a unit? Feet. 12 feet. P, perimeter, octagon, equals to 12 feet. All right. Problem solving time. So this time it's uh, solve a simpler problem. Guys, remember, if you want to take a break at any time during the video, go ahead and do so. Anyhow, if you don't want to or you came back, we're going to move on with solving simpler problems. Rolanda? 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 I mean, I guess that depends on where you live because the accents are different. And Todd made 14 congruent pentagon-shaped signs for a school event. They plan to add a duct tape border around the edges of each of the signs because duct tape makes everything better. 
if each side of the pentagon is 24 inches, how much duct tape do the students need? So, what do we know? We know the amount of signs there are and the shape of the signs and the fact that the signs are all congruent. We also know that each of the signs have duct tape edges or are going to have duct tape edges. And we also know what the length of each of these sides is. So what do we need to find? We need to find how much duct tape that is. Now how do we solve a simpler problem here? Solving a simpler problem would be something like, uh, hmm, how much duct tape would one sign need? So that's each side of the pentagon each side of every single one of the pentagons is 24 inches. So pentagons have five sides because penta is five. So one pentagon would need 24 times five inches of duct tape. And that is 120 inches of duct tape. So what about 14 signs? Then you figure that out. 120 times 14. 4 times 0, 0. 4 times 2, 8. 4 times 1, 4. 1 times 0, 0. 1 times 2, 2. 1 times 1, 1. Remember to move the things one place value to the right, just like I taught you in your multiplication chapters. Add them up. 0 plus nothingness is still 0, 8 plus 0 is 0, 4 plus 2 is 6, nothingness plus 1 is still 1, and you end up with 1,680 inches worth of duct tape. That's how much duct tape they need. That is a lot. I mean, I know that duct tape is very strong and can help reinforce your signs, because I remember trying to make signs in my middle school and then halfway through they ripped and it was very sad because of how much time we spent on those signs. Oh dear. Is the solution reasonable? I mean, in this mathematical scenario, it would be reasonable because I don't, who would actually use this much duct tape and second of all almost nobody makes pentagonal signs especially not that big reread the problem to make sure our stuff is all correct here's the thing when you reread the problem you don't when you read a math problem you don't actually need to remember a lot of the things. Sometimes you do need to remember every single detail of the problem, but for things such as this, you can just go, people made 14 congruent pentagon shaped things. The key here is congruent pentagon shaped and 14. 14 congruent pentagon shaped. And then they plan to add a duct tape border around the edges border around the edges of each of the signs, each stressing on each. If each side of the pentagons is 24 inches, each side 24, how much duct tape do the students need? So our numbers are all correct. Anyhow, checking over our calculations to see if our answer itself makes sense, at least mathematically, because it's a math problem. Math problems are the one place where a person can drink 68 gallons of orange juice in one go. Fun fact, I'm quite sure 68 gallons is more than your bathtub. Or at least more than the average bathtub. Anyhow, Are our calculations correct? Do do do, checking, checking.
Zzz, scanning, checking. No, I'm not a robot. I'm just making noises with my mouth because I don't know. Something has to fill in the void. Yeah! Our calculations are all correct. On to the next section. And of course, if you learn about perimeter, you have to learn about area. Now, for now, the areas that we are dealing with, the areas that we are dealing with, get it? Get the joke? No? Okay. Anyhow, what we are dealing with right now is more specifically towards rectangles and squares. The calculations and the method of calculation, well, they're different for most of the other shapes, including the other quadrilaterals, they're, they, they're different. Let's leave it there. Anyhow, area is the number of square units needed to cover a region or figure. So there's two ways to figure it out. Count the number of square units. And in case you haven't noticed, if there's a lot, it's easy to mess up. And really, it's a rectangle, or squares, but you could just do, you know, they're all in a neatly done rows and columns. What does this kind of look like? Multiplication. Multiply the length times the width. So the formal equation for area uppercase a for area of rectangles is a equals to length times width lowercase cursive l for length lowercase uh, cursive w for actually no it's not really cursive it's more italics italics w for width most variables in math they're going to be printed out in italics. So they're slightly stanted. Now for squares, it's A equals to side length squared, which means side length times side length. Since length and width in a square, it, they're kind of the same. For example, in this one, if you do the multiplication method, because there's obviously a lot of squares there, square units there. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 9 times 4, 36. So let's find the area of each figure. Here we have a square. The length is 1, 2 units. The width is 1, 2 units. The area is 2 times 2 square units, which is four square units. You can also write it as four units squared or four u exponent two. Now some teachers they don't really like this way of writing it. Some teachers they don't mind. Some teachers they use the way of that way of writing it. I mean, personally, I find this easier to write, but I have met teachers before that don't like this at all, so ask your teacher before writing it. Now, question number two, length, one, two, three, four, five, six, width, one, two, three. Area is six times three units, squared, or square units, or u exponent 2, I'll stop. And that's 18 square units. Now, I'm going to use this writing, but keep in mind that if you want to use this type of writing, you have to ask your teacher first because some teachers don't like it. So, question number three. Oh, right now we don't really have units. It's 12 meters by 16 meters. And on a side note though, these diagrams
terms are actually to scale, technically. When, since they have grids, but a lot of mathematical diagrams that you will find out there, unless, usually, especially the ones on like contests and tests, a lot of the time they are not to scale. And a lot of the times they will specifically write in fine print, not drawn to scale. Anyhow, 12 meters times 16 meters. Oh, here's a bit about the unit squared. So you have 12 times 16. 12 times 16 is... One hundred and ninety-two. And then it's meter, meter. Meter times meter is meters squared. Because in exponents, squared is when you multiply two things together. Like three times three is three squared. That's how exponents work. This would be so much easier a lecture if you guys were in grade five. Because in grade five, that's when you start learning about exponents. Something to look forward to or dread, depending on if you like or hate math. Here we have 18 times 12. 18 feet times 12 feet. And that is equal to 18 times 12. <laughs> 216 feet squared, or square feet. Now as you can see, because we have these units here that aren't really square units, and this isn't exactly 12 squares, that's why a lot of the times you will end up having to use multiplication. Because, personally, I, myself, have barely seen these grids. Unless it's in graphing, I barely see these grids. Most of the times it's just a straight up diagram with numbers. And you can't exactly draw your own grid because the scaling would be really, really awkward and strange and you know you have to calculate for scaling and then you have to make sure that your rulers lines are completely accurate. So honestly, it's just less of a bother to just do the calculations by hand. Now, five centimeters by five centimeters. That's five centimeters times five centimeters. And five times five is equal to 25. And then centimeters times centimeters is centimeters squared or square centimeters. 15 times 20, 15 meters times 20 meters is equal to 300 meters squared because 15 times 20 is 300 meters times meters is meters squared or square meters. Whichever notation, way, method, using whatever words, however you want to say it, just make sure that it's either meters squared or square meters because people can understand you if you say either. If you say something else though, I mean, I don't know what you're going to say personally, but chances are it's not going to be as widely uh, understandable. Now anyways, you can take a break at any time during the video, but if you don't want to take a break or you just came back, hi! It's problem solving again. And this time it's the pros and cons of different strategies. Now there are many ways to solve most math problems. You will decide which strategy works best for you when you read the problems or problem, if there's only one problem. So here's some problem solving strategies. There's reasonable answers, which is usually used for estimating and quickly, quick checks. So when you want to check your answer really fast 
as in you don't actually have that much time to do the entire problem again or to run through the entire problem, then usually you would look for reasonable answers. Act it out, don't use it. Just don't. I know that some people will learn better by la acting it out. It's fine if you're learning. It's just that in math class, there will be tests. And guess what's the one thing that you can't do on a test? <laughs> Basically, on a test, you usually only have probably a ruler, a protractor, depending on which grade you're in, maybe a calculator, a pencil, and an eraser. You can technically use a pen though, although it's math class. Who uses pens in math class? It's never a good idea. Never. Anyhow, so the general consensus towards this particular strategy is please don't. I have known people that physically cannot picture things in their head, so they have to draw some things out. Or they have to look at pictures of some things. I don't mind that. It's just that you can't physically do this on a test ever? Really? So it's kind of, well, it's a math class. There's always going to be tests. So if you can't do that particular, if you can't use a particular strategy on a test or an assessment in math, it's generally not a good strategy to use regularly because then you get used to using that strategy and then things just get awkward from there. Guess and check is for when you don't know better methods. Basically, if you're going to guess and check, chances are you don't know what you're going to be doing. I mean, I've used this before a few times in my life. Once I was looking at a math question and it was the hardest question on that pretty sure the competition actually it was, was it it was one of the hardest questions and I look at it and I'm like what is this what am I staring at like I knew what it was generally about but I didn't really know how to do it so then I ended up having to use guess and check with the multiple choice answers provided and I found an answer which is great but usually, there's better and more time-efficient methods than guess and check. So, guess and check is for when you don't know better methods. Or, when you just straight up don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Look for a pattern. Patterning is usually for... Well, look for a pattern is for patterns. A lot of algebra. So there's a reason why it's called patterning and algebra. Algebra has a lot of patterns in it. Geometry has some patterns in it too. And most of the rules of math, the laws in math and the rules, well, they come from patterns. But usually patterns, they're a good way to solve a problem. There's also solve a simpler problem, which means for when there are too many steps. Or, actually it's not, you can use it for too many steps, but it's mostly for sub-problems, like there's smaller problems within the problem. And straight up using math is just, it's a math class. You're always going to be using math. It's a math class. What did you expect? Language arts? 
I mean, sure, you technically use language arts all the time because you're, you have to understand what you're doing when you're reading a question. Jason likes to exercise. He does flexibility training every other day and endurance training every four days. He also tests himself every 10 days. If he does all these activities on the 15th of May, when would the next time he does all three be? Or when would be the next time he does all three? Essentially, the first step is understanding. What it means is, what did I just read? And what am I supposed to do? <laughs> now, what did you just read? Some things you don't need to remember, such as Jason likes to exercise. That doesn't really contribute to the problem. It's person does flexibility training every other day, or person does training A every other day, training B every four days, and test every 10 days. Person does all these activities on 15th of May. What am I supposed to find out? When would the next time person does all three be? Or when would be the next time person does all three? The plan, choose a strategy. For this one, we could just use math. Now in grade four, you guys haven't really learned about this yet, the specific way to solve this problem. So you're just going to have to use probably a chart. As in, well, usually when you make a chart or a table, a lot of the times it's also involved in patterning. So, 15th of May, 5.15, he does all three. And then two days later, he does, uh, which one was it? Flexibility. So... Endurance test. Flexibility, it's the 15th, 17th, 19th, 21st, 23rd, 25th, 27th, 29th. And then endurance, it's uh, the 15th, four days, 19th, uh, 23rd. 27th and 31st. Oh, he also does this on the 31st. The test is the 15th, the 25th, and okay, 10 days. The 4th of June. Right. Okay then, this is a bit of a problem because, well, he obviously doesn't do it within the month, so let's stretch on a little bit more. The next time he does uh, flexibility would be the second and then the fourth, oh, the fourth, and the next time he does endurance would also be the fourth of June. So. The next time he does all three, this time Jason does all three is the fourth of June. All right. The last step, check, is essentially check over your work and make sure you have the facts right. So, you reread the question, Jason likes to exercise, flexibility training every other day, endurance training every four days, tests himself every ten days. If he does all these activities on the 15th of May, when would the next time he does all three be? Or when would be the next time he does all three? And you check over your work. 15, 17, blah, 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 This is two days every other day. This is every four days. And this is every 10 days. So, 
our work is correct. We haven't read the problem wrong. So our answer should be correct. Actually, if our work is correct, and we didn't read the question wrong, then our answer is correct. Sometimes, the official answers will, in fact, be wrong. I have seen one official answer that told me that a solar eclipse was when the moon was behind the Earth. That's a lunar eclipse. <laughs> Most of the time, the official answers are right. The official answers, yeah, they're, they, they're right most of the time. Most of the time. There are times where they mess up, just like normal people. Anyhow, use any strategy shown below to solve. Tell what strategy you used. Ah. Uh. Henry's house has a rat and cockroach infestation. Never a good thing to have. Because rats, those things, they reproduce very quickly. You may think that baby rats look cute while they grow up to be big menaces. And cockroaches, fun fact, they can actually run around for a while after they, you cut their heads off. So unless you squish them completely, well, you're not going to get rid of that cockroach for a while. He decides to count the number of rats and cockroaches or the amount. He sees and documents the amount of legs that would be. This! This is a mark of a man, or boy, or teenage male, or, yeah, he uses male pronouns, so, person that is way too bored. Because why would you do this? In the end, he gets uh, 564 legs on 100 animals. How many of each animal did Henry see? So, assuming that all the rats have four, actually, you know, he says document the amount of legs that would be, which means that he also assumed, probably, that all the rats have four legs. So, four R plus cockroaches are bugs, they have six legs. Six C equals to 564 r plus c equals to 100. now the most efficient way to do this is basically algebra it out and not patterning it algebra math algebra so the strategy that we used is math the best way to do this problem is well you rearrange the equations a bit. And you get rats, the number of rats equals to 100 minus the number of cockroaches. And then you substitute in this equation to, well, the first equation, and you end up with four times, because rats is R, four times 100 minus cockroaches, that's 100, not 160, guys, plus six cockroaches equals to 564. And then that would give you 400 minus 4 cockroaches plus 6 cockroaches equals to 564. And if you do some simplifying, if you say you minus 2 from something and then you add in 3 then that's technically you add one in total. If you take off four of something and then you put back in six, then the net amount that you change would be just you put in two. So this would be two cockroaches equals to 564 minus 400 is 164. And that would mean that cockroaches equals to 164 divided by 2, which is 82. So there's 82 cockroaches. And that would mean that rats is 100 minus cockroaches. So rats equals to 100 minus 82 equals to 18. Okay. If you want to check this over... 18 plus 82 equals to 100, check, 4 times 18 equals to 72, plus 6 times 
Eighty-two is four hundred and ninety-two, and then you add them up, and you end up with five hundred and sixty-four legs. So yeah, everything's good. We've checked our calculations technically because in algebra, the way that you check your calculations is to re-plug everything into the original equations. Yeah, algebra is fun like that. Anyhow, George pays five dollars per tile for his kitchen. Okay, so he's tiling his kitchen. If the kitchen was thirty feet by twelve feet and each tile was one square foot, how much would tiling the kitchen cost? Okay, so thirty feet by twelve feet. We just learned it's math, guys. Math. We just learned about area. Now, what's thirty times twelve? Well, what's three times twelve? Three times twelve is thirty-six, and then there's a zero. You plop in the zero, and you get three hundred and sixty. So that's how many square feet there are. And since each tile is one square foot, three hundred and sixty divided by one is still three hundred and sixty. So the total cost would be three hundred and sixty tiles. And since each tile is Five dollars, three hundred and sixty times five equals to one thousand and eight hundred dollars. All right. Is our calculations correct? And did we read the problem right? Five dollars per tile, thirty feet by twelve feet, each tile one square foot. How much would tiling the kitchen cost? All right, our calculations are they good? Da 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 da. Yup, they are. All right, we can move on to the next question. Of course, guys, I know that a lot of kitchens have. Even though the kitchen might be thirty feet by twelve feet, you still have countertops. You might have a kitchen island and all that stuff. So not every bit of the floor is tile. However, this is a math question. So sometimes in math, well, as I said, you can drink sixty gallons of juice in a day. Sixty gallons is more than the standard bathtub. Anyhow, Logan can ride his bike thirty kilometers in one hour. That's a little bit more on the upper average of speed, but that's not a bad speed. It's a little bit on the upper average. Why would it be a bad speed? Is it reasonable to say he could ride his bike two hundred and sixty-five kilometers in eight hours? Well, you see, if it's thirty kilometers in one hour, and thirty times eight equals to well, two hundred and forty. Two hundred and forty is kind of smaller than two hundred and sixty-five. So no, it's not reasonable. No, it is not. Technically, we used math and.、Uh, Reasonable answers, because well, it's a question asking whether or not the answer is reasonable. Why would you not use reasonable answers for that? Last question of the section: In a pancake eating contest, Ruth eats nineteen less pancakes than Krista. Okay, Ruth equals to Krista minus nineteen. And Krista eats six less pancakes than Kimberly. So Kimberly, actually no, my yeah Kimberly minus six equals to Krista. If Kimberly eats forty-eight pancakes, how many pancakes does Ruth eat? Okay, so the strategy is math. You plug in the values. Forty-three minus six equals to Krista. Krista equals to thirty-seven. Thirty-seven minus nineteen equals to Ruth. Ruth equals to eighteen. Ruth eats eighteen pancakes.
18 pancakes. All right. There's actually a world record for uh, pancakes eaten. There was this man, apparently, who ran a marathon flipping a pancake, which I mean is a skill I can't even flip a pancake properly because I'm too worried that I'll miss and it will just splat on the stove and that would not be a good thing. Trust me, if you've ever cooked, then you would know that, well, cooking leaves a mess. And uh, if you, since you guys are young, I'm not sure, but a lot of the times, your parents will probably help you clean up that mess. If you become older and you want pancakes, but your parents don't want pancakes, and you make pancakes yourself, so any mess that you make is your responsibility, which is why whenever I make pancakes, I don't flip them, because I know I will miss. Anyhow, moving on. If you want to take a break at any time during the video, feel free to do so. Section 7 is about complex figures and the area thereof. When you need to find the area of a complex figure, you can break the figure into smaller, simpler parts. Use this example to learn more about breaking a figure into smaller parts. You see, you see, in this example, there's one rectangle and a second rectangle. I don't know what accent that was just in, but I don't mean to insult anybody if that happens to be their accent. Anyhow, so the first rectangle here has length and width of 15 meters and 3 meters. So 15 times 3 is 45 meters squared or square meters. And this one over here this rectangle has 10 meters and 5 meters. 5 times 10 equals to 50 meters squared. Add this up and you get 95 meters squared. And that's the area of the complex figure. You get it now? So let's find the area of each of these figures. Now technically for stuff like this you can do subtraction because over here it's 5 centimeters and here it's 11 minus 4 equals to 7 centimeters. So technically you could do 11 times 11 is this big square minus this little rectangle chunk that was taken out of it. So that's 11 times 11, 121 square centimeters. And minus uh, 7 times 5, 35 square centimeters. And that would leave you with uh, 86 square centimeters. But you could do it the, uh, how would I say this, more conventional way and just break it up. You can break it up this way and get 7 times 6 plus 4 times 11, or you could break it up this way and you get 6 times 11 plus 5 times 4. Let's go with 6 times 11 plus 5 times 4. And that is equal to 66 plus 20, which is 86 centimeters squared. We still get the same answer no matter which one of the three ways we do it. As long as we use it, use a actual way to do it and not just pull numbers out of nowhere, we're fine. Now where did I pull this five out of? Because this, this, is, this is a square or a rectangle. The opposite sides are going to be equal length. And in case you haven't noticed, 11 minus six is equal to five. Now here, Let's divide it this way. We have 4 times 11 plus 3 times whatever this is. And whatever this is, is 11 minus 4. 11 minus 4 is 7. So 3 times 7. And that is equal to 4 times 11, 44 plus 3 times 7, 21, and then you add them up, 
65 meters squared. Remember to get the units right, kids. Anyhow, moving on, we have, oh, these are easier because 6 meters by 6 meters and 4 meters by 10 meters. And the division is pretty, well, obvious. So 6 meters by 6 meters, 6 times 6, plus 4 times 10, that's a plus sign, not whatever symbol that I just drew. 4 times 10, 6 times 6 is 36, plus 4 times 10 plus 40 equals to 76 meters squared. Question number 4, we have this rectangle up here, so that's 4 times 5, and this one down here, which is plus 5 times 11, and that is equal to 20 plus 55, and that is 75, check the units, it's centimeters this time, centimeters squared. Moving on, for this one over here, we have the dimensions of all the sides. So we could do it with 10 times 14 minus 4 times 6, so the big rectangle minus the chunks that got taken out of it, or we could do 6 times 6, which is this square right here, plus over here, 8 times 10. And the second one that we have will give us 6 times 6, 36, plus 8 times 10, 80, 36 plus 80 is 116. The first way we do it will give us 140 minus 24, and that is equal to 116. Both of these would give us the same answer meters squared. Remember to check the units. Now, I mean, both of these would give us the same answer. Both of these work. So do whichever one you'd like. I'll just use the addition one though for this. So we have 3 times 8. And this bigger rectangle here, which is uh, 24 times 9, plus 24 times 9. Okay, 24 times 9 is going to be a big number. 3 times 8 is 24. 24 plus 24 times 9. It's not as if 24 times 9 is just 24 nines added together, or 9 24s added together. And if you add another 24 onto it, then that's like 24 times 10. Plus 24 times 9 equals to 24 times 10, which is then equal to 240. Now, if you really want to figure out what 24 times 9 is, that's... 216, 216 plus 24 is still equal to 240. Now don't forget the units, guys. This one is centimeters. Centimeters squared. Alright, that's it for this chapter. See you next chapter.